Okay, hi, I'm Melissa Green, a Technology Accessibility Training Specialist with the Office of Information Technologies Emerging Technology and Accessibility Team. Our unit works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with the university's web presence and our instructional and emerging technologies. And you can learn more about our efforts by going to our website at accessibility.ua.edu. A quick moment for housekeeping. Um, I've muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers. But when you want to talk, just click the microphone icon in your Zoom controls to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off. Please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. When I'm talking or sharing my screen, please write in the chat box and let me know if you can't see or hear something. I'll um, Try to keep an eye on that while I'm talking. Um, I'll do my best to check in every once in a while. If I don't see your question or comment immediately, don't worry, I will come back to the chat box at the end. This slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off to preserve bandwidth, but I thought you might like to see who you're speaking with today. Um, during today's webinar, we'll look at creating Microsoft Word documents that are accessible to people with disabilities. This session will cover finding and using accessible Word templates, using the accessibility checker to identify and fix potential accessibility issues, using built-in headings and styles to make documents easier to navigate, adding alt text to visuals and tables, accessible hyperlinks, text and tables, and finally, saving files as accessible PDF documents. When we offer this session in the classroom, it's usually as a hands-on workshop. Uh, since that's difficult to do in this webinar environment, I'm going to describe what I'm doing as I do it so that if you're interested in following along with the recording later, you'll be able to do so. I'll send you a link to that recording via email in a few days, and that email will include uh, additional resources, including links to the relevant Microsoft and other documentation. With that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. The most powerful weapon in your Microsoft Word accessibility toolkit is the accessibility checker. The accessibility checker that's built into Microsoft Word finds accessibility issues in your Word documents. And this tool is also present in PowerPoint, Excel, and Outlook on the web. The accessibility checker generates a report of issues that could make your content difficult for people with disabilities to understand. It explains why you should fix the issues and then walks you through how to fix them. We are going to use the accessibility checker to check the accessibility of a document that includes information about some of the traditions at the University of Alabama. If you're an Office 365 user, you'll find it very easy to open and use the Accessibility Checker in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. The screenshot on this slide shows the Review tab in the ribbon of the Office 365 version of Microsoft Word. To open the Accessibility Checker, you would select the Check Accessibility button on the Review tab on the ribbon. It's right there with uh, other tools like spelling, grammar, word count, and so on. If you have an older version of Word, um, Excel, or PowerPoint like I do, and you do not see the Check Accessibility button on the Review tab of the ribbon, you can follow these steps to open the Accessibility Checker. You can go to File, and then Info, select the Check for Issues button, and in the Check for Issues drop-down menu, select Check Accessibility. The Accessibility Checker task pane appears next to your content and shows the inspection results. So after the Accessibility Checker inspects your content, it reports those inspection results, and it categorizes them as errors, warnings, and tips. So if people with disabilities are unable to read the content in the file, the Accessibility Checker classifies it as an error. And most of the errors in this particular document include 
um, or have to do with missing alternative text. So the accessibility checker is telling us that pictures two and four, picture three, a table, and chart six are all missing alternative text. If the content in the file is difficult for people with disabilities to read, the accessibility checker gives a warning. And warnings in this particular file include a link that has unclear text and um, some objects, in this case pictures, that are not in line. When there's content that uh, may not necessarily be an error or a warning, but perhaps could be better organized or presented in a way that could uh, make it easier for people to access the document, the checker may offer additional tips. We don't have any of those present for this document. So my favorite thing about the accessibility checker is that it not only indicates where there's a problem and why the problem presents an accessibility barrier, it tells you how to fix it. Um, to me, it's not helpful just to know that something's wrong. I like to know what I can do to address it. So for example, um, one of our errors reads no header row specified. And at the bottom of the accessibility checker, there is some information about that error. We're told that we need to fix the error um, because a table header row contains column headings that provide context and aid navigation of the data in the table. And we're also told how to fix the error. So in this case, um, the accessibility checker tells us that to specify a header row, we need to select the table and highlight the top header rows. Um, Word actually did that for me automatically when I selected the particular error. Then click on the Table Tools Layout tab, which I'm going to do now. And then the next step it tells me to follow in order to fix this is to click Repeat Header Rows in the Data Group to mark the selected rows as headers. And watch the inspection results in the right column when I follow these instructions. So I'm going to click Repeat Header Rows, and that error disappears. The accessibility checker isn't going to catch every single accessibility issue. No automated checker can, but it is a great resource. Most of the issues that present barriers to access, including those identified by the accessibility checker, can be prevented or fixed by following just a few simple practices that we'll look at now. You can enhance the accessibility of your office content by using built-in styles and templates with fonts and colors that are easy to see. And Microsoft offers a collection of templates that help you make your content accessible to everyone. These templates use accessibility features provided by Windows and Office and have things like better color contrast, larger font size, headings in a logical format, and more. You can find the accessible templates by going to office.com and searching for accessible templates, or you can get to them from within your Office application. So we're going to do that now. I'm switching into uh, Microsoft Word, actually in, back into the document we were looking at just a second ago. Let's say I want to begin a new document and I'd like to use a, an accessible template as the basis for that document. In order to do that, I would go to File um, in the Word ribbon and then choose New to start a new document. And then I could search for online templates and I can find accessible templates just by searching for the word accessible. and a number of different results will appear. Uh, one thing I'd suggest that you do before you use any of these templates, or if you're just curious about learning more about accessible templates, is to explore the accessible template sampler. So that's one of the results that came up when I did my search. You could also search for accessible sampler and that'll bring you right to it. So the Accessible Template Sampler, and one of these is available for Microsoft Word, one for Excel, and one for PowerPoint, brings together a sampling of the most popular accessible uh, templates, in this case for Word. Um, so you can uh, choose Create, and actually explore some of the various templates that are available. So that's a good 
way to kind of get an idea of what's there. Um, when I use Word, I like to bookmark my favorite templates. So you might have noticed I actually have that sampler pinned here so I can come back to it easily. Welcome, we're just getting underway. You can make content in your Word documents easy to navigate by including section headings. And this is especially important for screen reader users and those who use assistive technology like a switch or mouth stick to access and control a computer or smartphone. So a screen reader is a software program that converts digital text into synthesized speech enabling users with visual disabilities to hear content and navigate with the keyboard. Screen readers are also used by people with certain cognitive or learning disabilities or users who simply prefer audio content over text or like to hear audio in addition to written text. When your document lacks headings and other structural markup, screen reader users have to pr progress through all of the content in your document from beginning to end. It's kind of like having to listen to an automated phone menu in which all of the choices are presented one by one before you are allowed to make a selection. That's no fun, I don't enjoy doing that. Um, and that experience is, is much worse when we're dealing with long documents. So um, we're gonna talk about adding important structural markup that allows screen reader users to skip directly to the content in which they're interested. Easier navigation and searching is also important for people who have limited or no movement in their hands or arms and use wands, sticks, or switches to access the computer. Without headings in the document or other structural elements, these users may have to tap dozens of times uh, to access the content in which they're interested. Switching back to our document um, with several accessibility errors now. Um, one of the main problems in this document is that I've used visual formatting rather than actual structural markup um, in order to kind of designate the different sections or pieces of this document. Um, so the way that, that the first word processing I ever did was writing papers for school. And I learned to format the title of my paper by applying visual formatting to it, by centering it, uh, maybe making the title bold or underlining it, um, putting it in a different size font and so on. I think that's the way most of us learn how to construct documents in Microsoft Word and other word processing programs. So this document is about uh, traditions at the University of Alabama, and it outlines different types of traditions, um, like football, the million dollar band, school songs, and the rammer jammer cheer. And some of those major sections um, have subsections to them. So for example, the school song section has subsections on the alma mater in Yay, Alabama. The section about the million dollar band has subsections um, related to the band's naming, its directors, and so on. And so a visual user can quickly scan this document and identify those sections because they're set off with visual formatting. The major sections I've put in a slightly larger font and I've underlined. Uh, the subsections I've italicized. So someone who can see this document can quickly scroll through, see what it's about, and if they're not interested in reading about football, can go directly to the portion on the band. However, um, I've only used visual formatting to indicate this information. I haven't added any real headings or structural markup. Um, one of the accessibility checker, this is one of the things that it will check for. Another way that you can quickly see that a Word document is lacking the structural markup is by turning on the navigation pane. So I'm gonna go to view and the navigation pane. And the navigation pane on the left side is empty. It has no headings. If this document had headings, it would look like an interactive outline of my actual document. 
So in order to make this document more accessible, I need to mark it up with actual headings and styles. So I'm returning to the Home tab. And um, currently, you know, the, the main heading in my document is the University of Alabama Traditions. I'm selecting that text, and I'm using the built-in styles to indicate that that's the title of my document. So I highlighted the relevant text and tagged it as a title by clicking on Titles in the Styles group. Now you may have noticed that the visual formatting changed. Um, this is one reason why people are sometimes reluctant to use the built-in headings and styles. There is a way to mark your text up without having its appearance change or to be able to control the appearance. We'll come back to that in just a second. But for now, I'm just going to go through and mark up the pieces of this document. So I've marked up the, the title as a title. The football is a top level heading, heading one. Beginnings of football at Alabama um, is a heading under football, so I'm going to use heading level two. When you're using headings, whether it's in a Microsoft Word document or on the web, it's important to use them in a logical order. Heading one, then heading two, then heading three, and not to skip heading levels. We wouldn't want a heading level two, three to appear before heading level one. Let me just mark up a few of these really quickly. This is a heading level three. Heading level three, million dollar ban is a heading level two, naming of the million dollar ban, heading level three, directors are level three, ban recordings level three. See how in the navigation pane to the left, um, I'm starting to get some content that shows that this content is actually structurally marked up as a heading. Okay, I think that's sufficient. So now um, a screen reader user could very quickly retrieve a list of all of the sections in the document, um, referencing the navigation pane here for a visual user. You know, that list would sound something like football, beginnings of football, crimson tide elephant, or they could just choose to see uh, the top level heading. So football, actually I did million dollar band at the wrong, no, that's right. There we go, heading level one, school songs heading level one. Got it. So they could choose to hear that this is a document that has three major sections, football, million dollar band, school songs, and go directly to the section in which they're interested. Um, this greatly enhances um, ease of use and navigability. Um, now we talked about how when I applied those changings, those headings, uh, the visual formatting changed. Um, you can have some control over this. So my preference is to quickly uh, go through a document and do all the marking up and then worry about how it looks later. So as I did just a second ago, I kind of went through and marked up the relevant text. I would then go to uh, the styles. Sorry, lost my toolbar for a second. and adjust the appearance of it there. So um, if you don't like the built-in designs that are here, so I'm, I'm on the design tab and I'm hovering my mouse over the different designs, the appearance of the document is being updated automatically. Um, you can choose one of these to update the appearance of your entire document. But if you don't like what's there, um, you can set that manually. So let's say University of Alabama Traditions, I wanted that to be bold. You know, I could go ahead and bold that and then right click on the title style and say update title to match selection. So there should only be one title in this document, but if I had marked anything else up as a title, it would also be updated and be bold. That's a little more evident with some of these headings, so let's do those. Let's say I want football to not be blue, but to be black. So I can change that here and then right click on heading one and choose update heading one to match selection and all of the heading one's formatting will be updated. So million dollar ban font color also changed from blue to black. We can do the same uh, for the other headings in the document. Beginnings of football at Alabama. I think I had that black and maybe italicized. I can update heading level two 
to match the selection and that change will be applied throughout the document. So in addition to being vital for uh, navigation, using the styles is also really handy because it allows you to quickly change uh, the visual appearance and the formatting of the entire document in just a few clicks. Applying headings also makes it really easy for you to generate an automatic table of contents. I'm going to do that really quickly now. So since I've added some headings to the document, I can uh, put my cursor where I want to insert a table of contents. I'm doing that um, toward the beginning of the document, just before the football section. And then go to the References tab and choose Table of Contents and select um, the style of table of contents I'd like to add. I'm just going to choose automatic table one. And that will build a table of contents based on the headings that I've added to my document. I chose automatic table of contents. If I were to continue to add to this document and the page numbers changed, I could automatically update that table to reflect the table of contents. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about headings, um, but we do that because it's very important uh, navigationally for screen reader and assistive technology users, but also because adding headings to your document is just so valuable um, for you as a content creator and those who, who may be visual users but are trying to navigate your documents, particularly when they're very long. So we've taken what was visual styles only and adding, added the actual elements that um, facilitate navigation for users with disabilities. We just talked about the importance um, of using those headings to make content easier to navigate. Another thing you can do to improve the navigability of your Word documents is to use bullets and lists appropriately. So I have a list in this document of directors of the Million Dollar Band. Um, I created this list by typing numbers. Um, so I type one and then a period and a space and then I would type the director's name. Hit enter to go to the next line, repeat the process. This visually looks like a list, but structurally behind the scenes it's not marked up as a list. So um, whenever possible, um, please use actual bullets and numbers um, to indicate lists. So the way I would change this to a real list is selecting that list and in the home tab in the paragraph group I would select the numbered list and it will update accordingly. It's also important to use uh, bulleted or unordered lists and numbered or ordered lists as intended. So if you're writing let's say technical documentation or anything else that is conveying a series of steps. You want to use a numbered list that alerts the assistive technology user that you are about to describe a series of steps that need to be followed sequentially. If you're just going to list um, some items that aren't necessary in sequence, don't have to be followed in order, let's say we were uh, putting together a newsletter for incoming students that suggested some items they might bring for their dorm room. Um, you use a bulleted list for that uh, because one could mix up the contents of that list and it would still have the same meaning. So it's not just a matter of visual formatting. Using bullets um, and numbered lists appropriately it really helps assistive technology users navigate your content. And this holds true again across platforms, whether it's a Word document or an email message or web content. So another basic principle of digital accessibility is ensuring your links make sense out of context by avoiding phrases like click here and more as link text. This is especially important because screen reader users often navigate from link to link, skipping the text in between, or use a keyboard shortcut to view a list of all the links present on the page, so removing all of the surrounding context of those links. So back to my fairly inaccessible document, I've got a couple links here. One is um, in the Yay Alabama section, which describes kind of the origins of our fight song. I have a link labeled Yay Alabama. Does anyone know 
or have a guess about what's going to happen when I click on this link. Feel free to, to venture a guess in the chat box. Um, I know because I created the document. If I'm looking at the surrounding context, you know, I kind of maybe get the idea that uh, clicking on the link, you know, is going to lead me to something involving the Yay Alabama fight song. But again, particularly for a screen reader user who might go directly to this link without reading any of the surrounding text, this hyperlink text is pretty meaningless. Clicking on this link could lead someone to a web page about Yay Alabama. It could start downloading a PDF with the lyrics to Yay Alabama. It could start playing an MP3. It could lead to YouTube video. Um, the link just doesn't give enough information about what the destination is and what's going to happen when a user clicks on it. So a more accessible alternative would be to edit the hyperlink text, which I'm going to do by right-clicking on the link and going to edit hyperlink. So the text to display is currently Yay Alabama. Um, this link does actually lead to a YouTube video. Um, it's a recording of the Million Dollar Band. More accessible text for this link. Um, there's not one perfect answer. What I would probably do is something like, um, you know, million dollar band performs Yay Alabama, and then maybe indicate that it's a video. Um, another option might be something like a colon, um, YouTube, million dollar band, Yay, Alabama, and so on. The exact words don't matter so much as the fact that you're telling the user, you know, what the destination is and what's going to happen when they click on the link. So um, uh, update the link text, click OK, and that link is now, aside from my spelling, um, a little more accessible. There's another problematic link in this document, and that is the link to the alma mater. So in this case, uh, the hyperlink text is the URL, URL itself. And that's a little better than the other link in the sense that the user knows what the destination is. You know, by clicking on this link, it's probably going to take me to YouTube and start playing a video. Um, however, this is a pretty unfriendly format for a screen reader user. Um, it's long and it has a lot of uh, letters, numbers, and symbols in it. So a screen reader would read this link aloud um, as https colon slash slash www.youtube.com forward slash w a t c h question mark v equals and so on. Um, so we want to not use actual URLs as hyperlinks unless um, that's important information. So instead, what I would probably do is edit the hyperlink and change the text to something like, you know, million dollar band sings the alma mater YouTube video, or something along those lines. Cases where um, it might be okay to include the URL as link text, you know, if the link is very short and clear, say, you know, uh, the engineering website can be accessed at eng.ua.edu. Or in some of our documents, we say visit us at accessibility.ua.edu. That's a short link. Um, it doesn't have a lot of extraneous numbers or letters or characters in it. You might also include the hyper actual hyperlink as link text in a document if maybe you're having a discussion of a link. So meeting minutes where uh, people were, you know, debating whether the, the new URL for student life should be studentlife.ua.edu or sl.ua.edu. You know, those URLs are relevant to, to the discussion, so it would make sense to spell them out. Just a little thing um, for the content creator, but is very impactful uh, for the user. All visual content um, in your Microsoft Word documents needs to have alternative text. Uh, this includes pictures, clip art, smart art, graphics, shapes, groups, charts, embedded objects, ink, and videos. Alternative text uh, or alt text helps users understand what's important in images and other visuals.
So screen readers speak the alternative text in place of images, allowing the content and the function of the image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. Alt text is also displayed in place of an image if an image file is not loaded or if a user has chosen not to view images. And when we're talking about online content like web pages or documents uploaded online, um, you know, the alt text can also be read by search engines. If you've ever used Google Image Search to search for an image, that's one of the ways that Google Image Search figures out which uh, results are most useful to you. It, it queries or spiders the alt text. Returning to our document, um, all of the images in this document are lacking alternative text. So to add alt text to an image in Microsoft Word, um, and Microsoft Word, like other Microsoft Office programs, there's generally three or four different ways to do any given task. You might have noticed that I'm fond of the right click. Most of these functions can also be accomplished through uh, the ribbon or keyboard shortcuts. And the documentation that I'm going to send you, it, it will provide um, alternative access methods for those of you who don't like to use right click. But I'm going to start by right clicking on this particular image and choosing Format Picture. In the Format Picture pane, I'm going to select Layout and Properties, and then select Alt Text. And the Description field is where we would provide a description that describes the content and the function of the image. So we don't just want to visually describe what's happening in the image. We want to think about why the image is there, and um, that's the information we want to present. So, um, for example, you know, this is an image that's about the million, this section is about the million dollar ban. This picture of Big Al may or may not be uh, meaningful content. I definitely don't think uh, we need a detailed description, you know, that Big Al is holding a white pom pom or he's followed by um, eight cheerleaders and so on. I might. Um, just say something like Big Al leads uh, the University of Alabama cheerleaders onto the field. Um, keep it basic. I'm typing the description in, in the description field rather than the title field because if I were to save this document as a PDF, the description, when typed in the description field, will um, also be included in the resulting PDF. If you type your description in the title field, um, it is not preserved on export. So you can type information in the title field. Um, cases when I might use that, actually I, I really rarely use it because I know that it will be lost when I save my document as a PDF. But I might use it if I was describing a very complex image, like an infographic. Um, so my title might be something like infographic of incoming student population data. Uh, but my detailed description would really go into all the content and function of that infographic. Um, that there are you know, 3,000 students in the new freshman class and such and such a percent from percent are from Alabama and such and such percent are from another state and so on. The title um, is just something brief that a screen reader user can hear announced and decide whether or not they want to read the description. But the main takeaway here is when adding alt text in Microsoft Office, um, if you're going to type anything, be sure to type it in the description field. The process is similar for adding alternative text to other visual content. So let's say um, this chart here with entirely fictitious <laughs> uh, data I made up about instruments played by million dollar band members. You can right click on that chart, choose format chart area, choose layout and properties, and then provide a description of the chart. This chart actually has several accessibility issues, um, just briefly pointing them out. Uh, we're using color alone to denote meaning, the font in um, some of the legend labels are very small, um, 
there's really no actual data here, so we don't know if this is based on, you know, a sampling of $10 million band members or if it's representative of all the million dollar band members. I'm not going to go any more detail about that other than to point out that you do need to provide descriptions for your charts and you can do that um, by accessing the format chart area. Same goes for tables. You can select them, right click them, choose table properties in this case, and then select alt text where you would provide a description in the alt text field. Sometimes the images in your content are purely decorative. Um, this document at the top of the page includes an image of the script A. And in this case, I did put it there because it's, it's purely decorative. It looks nice, it has the school colors, but it's really not communicating any kind of information to the reader of the document. If that's the case uh, for your images, you do still need to supply alt text, but you can supply what's called null alt text to tell the screen reader, hey, there's not really any meaningful information here. You can skip this image. So you do that by, again, right-clicking on the image and selecting Format Picture and then Layout and Properties. But instead of writing a visual description of the image, um, you would enter open and close quotation marks with no space in between. So quote, quote. Um, this is also what's used to indicate um, what's called null alternative text um, on the web. And it just tells the screen reader, yes, there is an image, but no, you don't need to worry about its contents. It's purely decorative. Now, in some contexts, we might want to describe the A. Um, if this were a document about the university's um, license and trademark or visual standards, then it might be meaningful to say that um, it's a, a script A that appears on a crimson background. If it were a graphic design class or people were examining typography, it might mean meaningful to describe, you know, how many serifs there are in the A and so on. But in this particular case, in this particular context, um, this is not meaningful information, so we can enter quote quote to tell the screen reader to ignore it. I mentioned color a second ago in the context of my terrible charts. Um, another impactful practice is ensuring that color is not the only means of conveying important information. And this is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, sometimes called color blindness, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning. Uh, using, by using more than just color to convey the information, you're providing multiple means of representation, so multiple ways that people might get at the information. To find instances of color coding, um, you may have to visually scan your document. If you yourself experience color vision deficiencies, you know, you might have to, and you're working on a document someone else created, you might have to solicit some assistance in doing this or adjust the colors in the document to make it possible for you to perceive. Um, people who are blind, have low vision, or have color, deficient, color vision deficiency might miss out on meaning conveyed by particular colors. There is an instance in our problematic document of color alone being used to convey meaning. I'm scrolling down to it now. There's some information in this document about the Million Dollar Band's notable halftime shows. And there's a note here that says, um, the shows that included signature songs are in red. And the first item in the list says um, that the Southern Gospel Show included a debut of Amazing Grace, which according to Wikipedia is uh, one of the signature songs of the Million Dollar Band. So this is problematic for users who, who can't see this document at all. They don't know what shows are in red. And then users who might have difficulty discerning red or discerning the difference between red and green. Uh, think about if color alone was used to denote uh, which meetings you're required to attend. So here's a list of meetings scheduled for this month, ones in red are, are required. Or here's a list of readings for the course, uh, red articles are required readings, green are optional. You know, if someone can't 
see those colors or has difficulty seeing the difference between the colors, they're going to miss out on very important information. So a different way of, of indicating this might be adding a symbol in addition to the color or what I would probably do is um, just restructure this. So maybe do a list of notable halftime shows and then break it out into a sub list of uh, shows that included signature songs or make a list of signature songs and denote at which shows they were debuted. So using color is okay, but we want to ensure that color alone is not used to convey meaning. When using color, you also want to check for sufficient contrast between text and background colors. So if your document has uh, a high level of contrast between text and background, more people can see and use the content, whether that be users with low vision or someone who's reading your document on their phone while uh, sitting on the quad in bright sunlight or has their screen brightness turned down um, because they're looking at their iPad in the dark, for example. I'm scrolling up to um, the very beginning of this document where the introductory paragraph has very poor contrast. It might be um, difficult or even impossible for some of you to see um, on your screen. So I've used a very light gray foreground text with a white background text and that does not provide sufficient contrast. The accessibility checker will help you look for this. Um, our team also likes a few other tools that I will send you links to in the follow-up email. There is um, one by Pasiello Group that is uh, called Color Contrast Analyzer that allows you to select a color um, by hovering over it or by typing in um, the color code and checking to see whether particular foreground and background color combinations have sufficient contrast. There's another one that I use a lot called the Web Aim Color Contrast Checker that does something similar. Um, a really low-tech way of checking this is to print the document um, or to print something that's formatted in color and grayscale, and that poor contrast will really kind of pop out at you. Let's move on to talking about how to save Word documents as accessible PDFs. Um, if you'll excuse me for just a second, I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay, I am going to transition to um, a version of this document that's a little more accessible. I ran the accessibility checker and corrected the errors present in the document we've been looking at. So this is the version of the UA Traditions Word document where the accessibility issues have been corrected um, and I have saved it as a PDF. This is the resulting PDF and I have the Adobe Acrobat tag panel open in the left sidebar. So although there's a bit more to it than this, when people talk about accessible PDF files, they're usually referring to PDF files that have these tags. Tags are the basis of an accessible PDF file. They indicate the structure of the document, uh, communicate the order in which the items should be read, and determine exactly which items will be read. You can see in the tags panel for this particular document um, that there's some structural information that's conveyed. Uh, some things marked up as a heading one, a heading two, a heading three. We have content that's marked up as a paragraph or tagged as a paragraph, as a figure, and so on. And if we expand these particular tags, we can see what that relevant content is. In this case, University of Alabama Traditions is our top level heading. Under that, there's a paragraph, followed by a second level heading about football, and so on. When creating a PDF from a Microsoft Word document, you want to do so in a way that preserves the accessibility of the source document and includes tags. So this is the version of the UA Traditions Word document where the accessibility issues have been corrected. I'm going to save it as a PDF now. If you have Adobe Acrobat on your computer, you'll want to use 
Acrobat's PDF Maker to create PDFs for Microsoft Office files. When the PDF Maker add-in is enabled, a tab called Acrobat will appear alongside the other tabs in Microsoft Word, like Home, Insert, Design, etc. I'm hovering my mouse cursor over it now. This is what you'll want to use when generating a PDF document from your source files. So I'm selecting the Acrobat tab. When you click on the tab, it shows you all of the options available within the PDF Maker. I'm going to select the Preferences button. This is not something that I do every time I create a PDF. I'm just selecting it for the purpose of showing you. These are the settings that are going to be used to generate the PDF file. And there's a lot of options here, um, and even more under advanced settings, where I'm hovering my mouse cursor now. I'm not going to go into any more detail about this, except to point out this checkbox right here. Enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF. You want this to be checked. Um, the second checkbox here, enable advanced tagging, uh, would it lead you to assume that enabling it would make the tagging even better in some way or in the resulting document. However, I've found the results to uh, generally be cleaner to not enable this second option. It's not enabled by default. Um, when I use the advanced tagging with the documents that I create, I find that I'm having to do a lot of cleanup in Acrobat. So uh, my preferred settings and the ones I recommend you start with are simply checking enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF. And again, once you've uh, set that once and saved it, you, you won't have to do that again. To make the PDF file, we'll click on Create PDF. I'm just going to leave the name um, as is. Actually, I'm going to add a number just to differentiate from the one I created earlier. So I'm calling this Traditions After 2 and clicking on Save. And Adobe PDF Maker will generate my PDF. If you do not have the uh, PDF Maker enabled on your computer, don't despair. Um, using that add-in in the way that I did typically yields the most accessible results, but there are other ways to create PDFs from Office documents. So going back to my document now, um, other ways that you could go about creating documents, you could go to File, Save as Adobe PDF. Again, that option's there uh, because I do have Acrobat installed on this computer. You could also choose uh, Save As, so File, Save As, and then select where you're going to save it. I'm going to put it here. Um, you'll Save As Type PDF. One thing that you'll want to check if you're saving your PDF from Word in this way, um, after choosing Save as PDF, is clicking on the Options button and making sure that Document Structure Tags for Accessibility is checked. It should be checked by default, but the next time you go through this process, double check to make sure. I'm going to say OK. And then I could click Save, and that would, again, generate a PDF. The only thing you want to not do um, is to choose File, Print, and then choose PDF as your printer. When you print something as a PDF, and even as an Adobe PDF, um, not all of that important work you did to make your source document accessible will carry over into the resulting PDF. So the heading information, um, alt text, tags, um, you know, some of it may come over, it really just depends, but in order to be ensure, to ensure that your document, uh, your PDF resulting from your Word document is as accessible as possible, you know, avoid using print and choosing PDF. You really want to save as PDF instead. So I'm going to go back to that PDF document I created from the Traditions Word document. 
once you've created a PDF, there's typically a few touch-ups that you need to do to make that PDF fully accessible. I'm not going to outline all of those. I'll send you some information about that. And if you'd like to learn more, we are offering a PDF workshop and webinar later this summer. One thing I will point out is that Acrobat has two built-in tools to help you create accessible PDFs, the Accessibility Checker and the Make Accessible Action. So I'm going to first um, access the Accessibility Checker. So I'm doing that by selecting Accessibility in my Tools group. I could also do that in the ribbon at the top of the page, Tools, and then Accessibility. And then to do an Accessibility Check, I would want to select Full Check. There's some different settings to indicate here, um, like what I'd like to be included in the resulting report, where I'd like it to be saved, and so on. I usually stick with the defaults. I'm going to choose Start Checking. And the Accessibility Checker has identified um, three issues in my document, and those are represented here in the left sidebar. Um, this document, I did quite a bit of work in Word to make it accessible, so there's not too many problems. Two things you'll always get um, are an alert to look at the reading order and the color contrast, because those require human to check. But almost always when you um, save a Word document as a PDF, you'll get this title failed error. For whatever reason, even if you've specified a document title in Word, it just doesn't carry over um, into Adobe Acrobat. So um, to address this particular issue, I can right click on it. And there's a number of different options here. I could skip the rule to ignore it, choose explain, um, and that will bring up some documentation that tells me a little bit more about the error and how to fix it, which I really appreciate for some of these more complicated errors. But in this case, I'm just going to choose Fix. It will open up the description dialog box where I can enter a title, and I'm going to call it University of Alabama Traditions. And select OK. And now I get a pass for the title. So that checker, I would do that as a last step um, after exporting a document from Word and saving it as a PDF. Um, the other tool that's built into Adobe Acrobat that can help you create accessible PDFs is the Make Accessible Action Wizard. And you can access that through your tools, Action Wizard, or in the Tools sidebar, Action Wizard. And then you would select Make Accessible. This is most useful um, when you have not started with an accessible source document. When you're trying to repair um, you know, a, a, something that someone else created and you don't have access to the source document, or maybe you're working with an image-only PDF that was scanned text, the Make Accessible Action Wizard will walk you through the steps of um, identifying actual text in the document, tagging it appropriately, checking the reading order, and so on. So um, if you do want to learn more about um, the PDF specifics, I do encourage you to, to attend one of our um, workshops or webinars on that. Also, I will send you some doc documentation for you to explore on your own. So we just have a few minutes left. I'm going to wrap things up um, just by reiterating that, you know, the university is committed to providing all users, including those with disabilities, an accessible technology experience. And all of us have the ability to create accessibility or create accessibility, create accessibility or disability in the design choices that we make. We don't have to be web developers. All of us are content creators. And um, through simple things like uh, making sure we describe the images in our emails or use logical reading order on our PowerPoint slides or running the accessibility checker in a Word document, we can enable access uh, for our colleagues and students. Um, I would encourage you all to do so and to create accessibility. We are here to help. Um, you can visit us at accessibility.ua.edu. That's all I have. If you have questions or thoughts to share, please feel free to unmute your mic and share them now or type them in the chat box.